Today's subject is a very serious one. It's a very delicate subject. It can even be classified as controversial. Today we're talking about conversion to Judaism. Now before we begin, I have to give a few disclaimers and caveats. As a matter of policy, our organization Torch, we don't get involved in conversions. There are experts that are dedicated to this very critical subject. Our policy has always been that we are, we're not involved. We don't get involved. We avoid it. And in fact, as a result, I have vacillated back and forth for years as to whether or not to even discuss this on the podcast. I consulted with people that I respect. And ultimately, I concluded that the benefits of discussing this subject in this forum, the benefits outweigh the downside. But I want to kind of lay out some of the caveats, some of the disclaimers to really frame the context of this presentation before we begin. In general, I try to avoid speaking on matters of halacha, practical halacha. For one, I don't consider myself an expert in halacha. I'm quite the novice. And I don't have much apprenticeship in these matters. And specifically with regards to conversion, I've never even participated in an actual proceedings on this subject. And therefore, you have to know ahead of time that my experience and my sphere of knowledge is very limited. And what I'm going to share with you today is is really my own views and my own interpretation of the sources as I understand them. But I also want to stress that this is for informational purposes only, for educational purposes only. I don't want it to sound like I'm giving some sort of definitive or authoritative take on this subject. Now, I try to source everything to make, you know, an extra effort to make sure that all the sources are substantiated. But I want to make it very clear and unambiguous before we begin that this is my take, my understanding of the subject. Put that out up front so you understand that clearly. Now, if it's such a serious and potentially controversial subject, why did I choose to speak about it nonetheless? Maybe it's best to ignore this subject. So that's a good argument, but ultimately, I think it's a hugely relevant subject, not just for converts and potential conversion candidates, i.e. for non-Jews, but it's also a very relevant and even interesting subject for Jews. So, of course, part of the subject is the mitzvot. There are mitzvot that relate to this. And Jews are obligated by mitzvot related to converts and conversion. But besides for that, conversion plays an important role in our national mission. When we study the sources, it turns out that a major aspect of our national mission, one of the fundamental responsibilities of our people, is to find those souls that are trapped amongst the nations, and bring them back to us. The Talmud tells us in the book of Psachim, page 87b, that the only reason why our nation was subjected to be in exile, surrounded by foreigners in foreign lands, why is that a feature of Jewish history? It's only so that we can collect the Jewish souls, the converts that are there amongst those nations. The Talmud thus plainly states that the sole reason why exile is such a prominent feature of our history, it's just to gather converts. Why were we expelled? Why did we suffer all this tumultuous exile? being scattered throughout the world over the course of our history, the Sadists tell us the goal of exile is to make converts. There are souls of Jews, potentially, that are trapped amongst the Gentiles, and our national mission is to liberate 
and to integrate those souls into our nation. Now, in contemporary times, this subject has become even more topical. Unlike most, if not all, eras of Jewish history, in recent years, there has been a groundswell of Gentiles clamoring to learn more about Judaism, about Torah, and even to consider to join the nation. There's been some sort of awakening to learn about Torah. And I personally get this question very often from Gentiles who discover the truth of the Torah. Many of them are wonderful people who just want to do what's right, and they're truth seekers. And many of them were raised to be very religious in other religions, but then they investigated, they inquired, they asked questions, and all of that house of cards just collapsed in front of them. And they just genuinely want to do what's right and are willing to forfeit whatever it takes to do it. And many of them reach out to me. You know, I have a podcast and you cannot obviously separate the audience and it's open for anyone to listen. And we, of course, appreciate all the listeners. But I'm often presented with this dilemma, what to do. And this is just, of course, anecdotal, but from discussions that I've had with other people, this is just something which is unique, this unique feature of our times, that there are many, many Gentiles that are curious about Judaism, about Torah, and about conversion. And as a result, I thought it would be beneficial to record and release an in-depth podcast on this subject, so we can lay it out from beginning to end, so that anyone who's curious about it, both those that have reached out and those that have not reached out, I imagine that the ones who have actively reached out to inquire about it by emailing me, RabbiWallBetima.com, that number is dwarfed by those who are lurking and are curious about it. I would lay it out for you, and this will be like a repository of all my collected knowledge and research and thoughts on this subject. And I thought we'd do it all in one episode to try to cover it all from the theoretical to the practical. We'll start off talking about the concept of conversion in general, the process, where it comes from, the history of conversion, the famous and consequential converts of our history. We'll talk about the philosophy of conversion, how it works on a philosophical level, some of the perils of the subject, the dichotomy of conversion, as I like to call it, and then we'll end with the practical components of this presentation. For a variety of reasons, I chose to do it all in one episode, so it's going to be a little bit longer than usual. You'll forgive me. And finally, it's a very serious topic, as I mentioned, and I hope to record it the requisite gravity that it deserves. So let's start off with the context of conversion. So there's a concept. It's called Gerus, it's called conversion, where a non-Jew undertakes some process, undergoes some process, enters it as a non-Jew, and emerges from it as a Jew. How does this fit into the context of, you know, the existing nation with our backstory, with our history? We have a Jewish nation that comes, of course, from the covenants that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And our people have gone through a lot. We went through the iron crucible of Egypt, hundreds of years of servitude. We were broken down. We were oppressed. We were tortured. We were tormented. And then we were built anew. We were reconstructed. We went through hell. And then the Almighty showed us his dominion. We had the templates and the humbling and the dominating of Egypt. And then we had the miraculous exodus and we get transitioned to this 40 years in the wilderness of living in this supernatural level, eating manna, drinking water from a rock, cocooned by the clouds of glory. We have Moshe, who is in direct communication with God. We have, of course, the Sinai revelation, this national revelation, national prophecy. And with this, the Jewish 
people to come into the Jewish nation. With Sinai, we committed ourselves to God. We forged an eternal bond with him. We committed ourselves to him completely like servants to their master. And he responded, he reciprocated by pledging himself to us. And this bond, this pact, this covenant is eternal. It cannot be reversed. It cannot be undone. And this bond still exists today. And that bond contains within it a whole host of elements. There are, there are rights that we are afforded and there are responsibilities that we must do. There's a whole bundle of sticks that constitute what it means to be the Jewish nation being God's people. Prior to the Exodus, prior to Sinai, prior to the Revelation, the Jewish people were designated to be the Jewish nation. We had the potential to be the nation of God, but we were not quite the Jewish nation. And yes, we know that the forefathers, they kept the whole Torah. They kept it before it was obligatory. Not all the mitzvahs. Of course, we know Jacob married two sisters, Amram. Moshe's father married his aunt. But certainly the concepts of the Torah and the laws of the Torah and the notions of the Torah, they were known ahead of time. And the forefathers, the forerunners, the precursors, the antecedents of the Jewish people, they kept the Torah to a certain extent before it was given. But on a very technical level, Abraham was not the first Jew. He was not obligated by the Torah. Of course, he was righteous, and the Torah, in fact, states that he did keep all of God's laws and statutes. And yes, he is, of course, our forefather. But in Abraham's times, the Jewish nation did not formally exist yet. The founding of the nation was with the Exodus and with the Sinai Revelation, and not before that. And the change from being uh, the the apparent nation of God, to being the actual nation of God, to have the whole covenant, that was accomplished with the Exodus and with Sinai. And the Exodus and the Sinai revelation, they included some very dramatic ceremonies. In Egypt, prior to the Exodus, right before the Exodus, the nation was circumcised. A few days prior to Sinai, the nation immersed in the mikvah. Also before Sinai, before the Revelation, before the Ten Commandments, the nation offered sacrifices. And then they were presented with an offer. Do you want to be the nation of God? Do you want to be the kingdom of priests and a holy nation? Do you want to accept what God is proposing? And the nation responded, Na'asev and Ishmael, we will do and we will listen. The nation completely accepted the Almighty and all that comes with being his people. And with that, the non-Jews really, the, the proto-Jews, the potential Jews, the designate Jews, the Jews apparent became the Jewish nation. Thenceforth, the covenant with God was activated. At that time, they became obligated by all the laws, by all the myths of the Torah, all 613. Previously, they were only obligated in the seven mitzvos, B'nai Noach, the seven Noahide laws, the seven universal mitzvos. We'll talk more about that in just a bit. But previously, before Sinai, that is all that the Almighty demanded of the Jewish people. Before they were Jewish, of course, before they were officially coronated as God's nation. But once they underwent all these ceremonies and all these rituals, they are elevated to a higher level of reality and existence. And now they are obligated by all 613. The previous seven are thenceforth insufficient. And now they're God's emissaries in the world, and they're they're tasked with fulfilling what he outlined for them. And of course, they benefit from the benefits 
that he extends to his people. With the sign of revelation, now God has a nation in the world. These are his people. These are the people who have committed themselves to bring his name into the world. We're going to earn the land. We're going to have his temple. We're going to keep the Torah mitzvos. And we are going to propel humanity towards perfection. That's the Jewish nation. That's our story in a nutshell. The concept of conversion is that this process, the process of transforming an ordinary person into a person that has a covenant with God, this process, this path, is not exclusive. Even people who are not descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they too can undertake this process. They can retrace the steps of the Jews at Sinai. Just as the biological descendants of Abraham, they underwent a process to elevate, to transform themselves into members of God's covenant, other people as well. They are also afforded with the same opportunities to make the same choice and to undergo the same process and to be obligated with the same responsibilities and to earn the same rights to be Jews as well. How does that happen? How does conversion happen? Again, by retracing the steps of Sinai. When the nation was forged, they did four things. Number one, they chose to be part of this covenant. They agreed to the terms of the deal. They signed on the line that is dotted. They said, we will do and we will listen. They committed themselves to God completely. Number one, they circumcised. Number two, they immersed in a mitzvah. Number three, number four, they offered a sacrifice. Jewish people became Jews with these four steps. If a Gentile wants to become a Jew, to convert, you must also have these four elements. You have to have a sincere desire to be part of the covenant, to commit yourself completely to God and to what he wants of his people. You have to circumcise, you have to immerse in the mikvah, and you have to offer a sacrifice. Now, the truth is that the sacrifice of a convert is slightly different in the type of sacrifice, in the precise rituals of the sacrifice that the Jewish people brought at Sinai, but the principle is the same. A Gentile can retrace what the Jewish people did at Sinai, and just as the Jews, the original Jews, 33 some odd hundred years ago, accepted the Torah and became God's people, a convert can do the same. They can join this glorious nation, this kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. And of course, that's for a man. Women cannot circumcise, so they are required to do only the other three elements in order to retrace Sinai, and that is the immersion in the mikvah, and the sacrifice, and the acceptance of the terms of the deal. Now, of course, today we don't have a temple as of this recording. So absent a temple, a convert cannot bring the sacrifice today. But that does not absolve them of bringing a sacrifice. When the temple gets rebuilt, the converts must bring the sacrifices that they should have brought at the time of their conversion had the temple been extant. This is the concept of conversion in general and the context of conversion. Our nation is not exclusive. There is a process by which others can join our ranks and all they need to do is to reenact what we did at Sinai many centuries ago. The Midrash tells us that there is a reason why the Torah was given in a desert. Desert is kind of ownerless. Anyone who wants to come in the desert can go there. 
So to the Torah, it is ownerless. Whoever wants it can have it. And no one really maintains ownership over the Torah. And a person cannot say, well, I I have Torah in my genes. I have it as a heritage. I got it as an inheritance. It was bequeathed to me by my antecedents. But you, you're a convert. You don't have that. In order to dispel that notion, the Torah was given in a desert to say that it's open for all. And the Midrash continues when Moshe finishes conveying his final message to the Jewish people. He says, Torah, it's on a Moshe. Torah was commanded to us by Moshe. It is the Morashat Hilas Yaakov. It is the heritage of the congregation of Jacob. Anyone who joins this congregation is part of this special relationship that we have with Torah. Erstwhile non-Jews can also go to the proverbial desert and can ascend the mountain and can reenact the revelation and join the people. Now, the ceremony and the process of conversion is overseen and orchestrated by a based in by a Jewish court comprised of three judges. But this is the opening of our discussion. This is the concept that has been present since the Sinai revelation itself. There is a way for other people to undergo the same transformations that the Jewish people did many centuries ago. Now, with conversion, the convert is transformed into a Jew for all matters. Just as is true with the rest of the nation, a convert can no longer subsist on seven Noahide laws. They are obligated to fulfill all 613. And just as is true with the rest of the nation, in the event, God forbid, that a convert violates one of the laws, they will be punished for any transgression. They're the same as any other Jew. Now, there are some technical differences, most notably tribal affiliation. Someone who is a convert does not have a tribal affiliation, and therefore, in the allotment of the land that was accorded to the 12 tribes, a convert is not entitled to a portion, though the verse in Ezekiel chapter 47 says that land is set aside for converts. There are some other laws that relate to specific converts. There are some restrictions on on marriage, so a female convert cannot marry a Kohen. And Moabite and Ammonite male converts can never intermarry with the Jewish people, but the females can. Egyptian and Edomite converts can intermarry after three generations have elapsed. But for all other laws, converts are indistinguishable from any other Jew. Now, there are mitzvos that apply to the whole nation regarding how we have to treat the converts. The Talmud gives two different calculations as to how many times are we warned in the Torah to love and to not take advantage of the convert. It's either 36 times or 48 times. There is an extra requirement to be nice to empathize, to love the convert, and to not take advantage of them. We have to be very sensitive to them. We have to be very gentle to them. The Talmud tells us that we cannot remind them of their previous life. We can't say, oh, don't don't you remember what you used to do before you became Jewish? Don't you remember? What was it like to eat all that food? And what was it like to eat all that non-kosher you're gonna the, the same mouth that ate all that non kosher is gonna come study Torah. It seems so inappropriate. That is prohibited. We're not allowed to convey that message to a convert. Now, converts have been present for a very long time. 
even Abraham and Sarah, the verse in chapter 12 of Genesis tells us that when they traveled to Canaan, they took with them the souls that they had made in Haran. What does it mean that you can make a soul? So Rashi tells us that they would create converts. Abraham would convert the males and Sarah would convert the females. Abraham and Sarah, this dynamic duo, they started a movement of monotheism. This was a movement that made waves in the world. They would argue and and debate and teach and educate and inform and prove and conjole and woo and court followers. And they amassed students and adherents to this movement, to this mission. And those students are described as converts. And when Abram and Sarah were instructed to go to Canaan, these people were so committed to this mission, they joined. Now, interestingly, this is the last that we hear of those students slash converts. Apparently, they drop off and they disappear from the story. But there is ample reason to believe that the souls of those original converts are actually the souls of all future converts. More about that in a bit. Of course, that was before Sinai. After Sinai, or at least after the Exodus, we meet the first actual convert, and that's Moshe's father-in-law, Jethro. Previously, he was a priest for idolatry. We're told that he would experiment with every single pagan deity. And when he heard about the Exodus and all the miracles that the Almighty did for the Jewish people, he said, I, I got to check these people out. And he was convinced. And he repudiated all the idolatry and he became a convert. And we read his story in chapter 18 of Exodus. And there's a very interesting verse that I want to zone in on. This is Exodus 18, verse 9. Vayichad Yisro. And Yisro was Vayichad. We'll see what that means in, in a bit. He was, Rashi tells us he was happy, but there are other interpretations that we shall see. He was happy over all the goodness that they might have did for Israel and that God saved them from Egypt. But what does this word Vayichad mean? Vayichad Yisro. Yisro was Vayichad. So the Talmud of the Book of Sanhedrin, page 94a, tells us two very interesting and almost opposing explanations. One opinion is that Yisro took a sharp sword. Cherev chada, the word chad, like vayichad, means sharp. He took a sharp sword and circumcised himself and converted. That's one opinion. The second opinion is that his flesh became chidudim chidudim. The second opinion is that his flesh got goosebumps. He had goosebumps of sadness because when he heard all about the destruction and the humiliation and the humbling of Egypt, Yisro was kind of saddened and he, he got goosebumps thinking about it. And the reason why is because Yisro himself, Jethro himself, was originally an Egyptian. Concludes the Talmud. And this is why, when you have a convert from a given nation, for ten generations you cannot make fun of their original source nation. If you have an Aramean convert, for ten generations... Even after they've gotten very integrated amongst the Jewish people, you cannot make fun of their previous nation because they're still sensitive to that. So two very interesting interpretations as to what this verse 18.9 of Exodus means, Vayichad Yisro. Now, what does it mean that he took a sharp sword and went over his flesh? So the Maral explains something very interesting. He says that when Jethro was circumcised, he used a very sharp scalpel. His circumcision wasn't just a a physical removal of the foreskin. 
It was also a spiritual excisement of all vestiges of his previous self. He used a very sharp knife. When he made a decision to join the Jewish people, he made sure to cut everything that connected him, that associated him with his previous life. He removed it all. But, says Maharal, this is unique to Jethro. Most converts don't sharpen their knives, so to speak. They use a dull knife, so to speak. With Jethro, the knife was sharp. He removed all remnants of his previous self. But other converts, there's still something left over. According to this, one interpretation we have of Jethro is that he really committed himself to joining the Jewish nation and to dissociating himself from his previous identity. The second interpretation as to what Jethro did is almost the exact opposite. He had goosebumps of sadness. He was, by birth, an Egyptian. And it it stunned him to hear about the downfall of Egypt. And that's why, for ten generations, the Talmud tells us, you cannot mock the convert's previous nation. Even though they've transitioned and they've joined the Jewish people, they're likely to still harbor some affinity, some association for that nation and for those people. Now, these two interpretations, it shows us the extremes, the opposite ends of the spectrum of this subject. We have two polar opposite interpretations of Jethro as a convert. Either Vayichad Yisro, it means that he still maintains some allegiance, some affinity to his previous life and to his previous nation. He had goosebumps of sadness. He was despondent. He was depressed over the downfall of Egypt. He still clung to some Egyptianness. The second opinion is the exact opposite. He used a sharp knife. He made sure to eliminate all remnants, all vestiges of his previous self. This shows us the, the variability that can exist amongst converts. A convert joins one nation, but by definition, leaves another nation behind. And there is the possibility of converting with just a dull knife, so to speak, with retaining some vestiges of your previous identity. And it takes 10 generations to dilute this influence. After 10 generations, or maybe after 24 different opinions in the sources, it's finally gone. And then there's this conversion with a sharp knife that completely and totally and permanently severs the convert from their previous self. And this dichotomy of the different types of commitment and transformations that exist amongst converts, this is something that appears later on in our study. Now, Jethro is the first convert in the Torah, but he's certainly not the last. His daughter, of course, Zipporah, she married Moshe, and she, we're told in the sources, she was a convert. The daughter of Pharaoh converted the mixed multitude that left Egypt with the Jewish people. They are considered converts. Jethro, we're told, went back to his family to convert his family. And then in the book of Joshua, we read about the intrepid Rachav, who aids the nation in the conquest of Canaan. She, we're told, converted, naturally married Joshua, according to the Talmud. Ruth, of course, is another famous convert. She is the great-grandmother of David, and thus the progenitor of Messiah. And she was a female Moabite convert, and we read her story in the book of Ruth. Now, there's a fascinating pattern that we have to investigate, and that is that some of the great sages and some of the great purveyors of Torah throughout our history, they're associated with converts. Either they converted themselves, they married converts, they're descendants of converts. 
That's one pattern that we have to investigate if we want to understand the philosophy of conversion. A second interesting pattern is the fact that many converts originate in some of the worst villains in our nation's history. So we talked already about Rachav. She was a prostitute from Jericho. She converted. But she's not the only person of suspect character, certainly when they were a non-Jew, who converted. Nevezrad and the butcher of Jerusalem who killed thousands and tens of thousands of Jews in the destruction of Judea, he converted. And the Talmud tells us that the descendants of Haman converted. Not only that, they converted and they taught Torah in, in Bnei Brak. And the descendants of Sisra converted and taught in Jerusalem. And the descendants of Sancheriv, who destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel and tried to destroy all of Judea, his descendants also converted. And even Nebuchadnezzar, Vuchanetzar, the king of Babylon who destroyed the first temple, his descendants wanted to convert, but God artificially stopped them. There are some very notable villains of our history, notorious characters of Jewish history, who either convert themselves or their descendants convert. And some of them become very famous. So, for example, Shemaya and Avtalion. These are descendants of Sancheriv, and these are the co-heads of the nation during the period of the Zugos, around the first century before the Common Era. Uncleus, He's the one who wrote the official sanctioned translation of the Torah. He was a nephew of the Roman Emperor Titus. And the Talmud tells us how he had to overcome his uncle's objections to his conversion. And Rabbi Akiva, the great sage of the second century of the Common Era, he descended from converts. And Rabbi Meir, the primary author of the Mishnah, he descended from converts. So we have interesting patterns here, famous and noteworthy and consequential converts that either come from very problematic stock, shall we say, very villainous stock. And we see many of those people, and many converts in general, play very important roles in the development, in the codification of Torah. These are patterns that we have to investigate. Why is it such that some of these really terrible people throughout history, they are, I guess, likely to convert? And why is it that converts seem to play a very important role in the development and the transmission of Torah? Now, when someone converts, what's their status? So, of course, they're obligated by all the laws of the Torah. But do they retain some status as a convert? Are they a a second-class citizen? The answer is a resounding no. The Midrash tells us that converts are beloved by God. The Midrash goes on to say that a righteous convert can be akin to Abraham. If someone is a real truth seeker and they want to find the truth and they examine and they ponder and they search and they find the Torah and they seek to nestle under the wings of the Shekhinah, the words of the Midrash, they are a righteous person to a certain extent akin to Abraham. The Midrash elsewhere tells us that they are beloved like Israel. It says that the Almighty loves the Jewish people, and it says that he loves converts. The Jewish people, our highest praise that we're servants of Hashem, we're servants of God. Converts, too, in Scripture, are classified as servants of God. Jethro, the aforementioned convert, the father-in-law of Moshe, 
he has a bunch of names in scripture. And one of them is Chovev, meaning beloved. And the reason why is because once he converted, he became beloved in the eyes of God. And the Midrash highlights the greatness of converts in their acceptance of Torah even more than Israel. The Jewish people, we accept the Torah after the Exodus. After we witness all these spectacular miracles of the Exodus, well, it's not so hard then to accept the Almighty and His dominion. But a convert is greater than Israel, says the Midrash, because they didn't have those miracles. They didn't witness that. They weren't eating manna, drinking water from a rock, witnessing the Defeat of Amalek, right after the Exodus. They didn't witness the ten plagues and the dramatic events of the departure from Egypt. And nevertheless, they were willing to accept the terms of Sinai. And thus, their greatness is even greater than the Jewish people. Once someone converts, they are granted, the Midrash tells us, with extreme, elevated, lofty holiness. And they have the potential, the extra potential, to bear very holy children. And we're advised in the Sefer Hasidim, for example, that if you see a convert with good character and modesty and, and kindness and pleasantness, and integrity, it's better to marry them than to marry biological Jews because you'll have more righteous children from such a spouse. The stature of converts is very high in our understanding. Like I mentioned earlier, large contributions to Torah came from converts and people associated with him. Moshe, who, who was he married to? He was married to a convert. And he was the son of a convert. And the translation of the Torah was done by Unculus, the convert. And the primary author of the Mishnah is Rabbi Meir, the descendant of a convert. And the oral Torah that we get, courtesy of Rabbi Ativa. It's not a coincidence that the converts play such an important role in the transmission of the Torah. Why exactly that's so? What the secret is, who knows? But it certainly shatters any notion that a righteous convert is somehow less of a Jew than a biological one. Now, what exactly is the philosophy of the transformation of a convert? How does this work on a philosophical level? What is the way via which a non-Jew enters into a process and a Jew emerges? So I say this, give it the following definition. They tell us, Ger is Geyer, a convert who converts, Katan Shinola Dami. It's like a baby that was born. When someone converts, on a spiritual level, they are born. Their previous identity ceases to exist, and a new identity is born. A brand new person emerges. And that's why we're told that a convert has all their sins expunged. If you're a new person, you're a new person. Brand new. You are one day old. You have no baggage. You have no previous sins that are attributable to you. You're a new person. And therefore, you are not responsible for what someone else did. That's not you. A convert has all their sins cleansed. 
Now, the Talmud goes so far as to say that in truth, they should completely lose their halachic affiliation with their previous family. So in truth, they should be allowed to marry the siblings, even though, of course, incest is prohibited for the non-Jew. But if a brother converts and a sister converts, they're like new babies. And they have no strings attached to the previous life. So in truth, they're not related. And they should be allowed to marry. But in practice, it is prohibited. But the principle that's being conveyed here shows us about what conversion really is. It's the emergence of a brand new person. It's a new person with no association, no affiliation with their previous identity, with the previous person that they were before they entered that process. And this is what's been highlighted a few times already by, uh, by Jethro's sharp scalpel. He completely excised his previous identity. He completely dissociated from his previous identity. And that's why his story is told at length. That's why he's the paradigmatic example of a convert. He is no longer the person that he once was. Now, if a person loses their previous identity and they're born again with a new identity, there is obviously an exchange that happens here. Something is removed and it is supplanted with something else. The new baby gets a new soul. And one of the most fascinating elements of this whole subject is to try to figure out where those souls come from. And it's interesting that everyone agrees that the righteous convert gets a new lofty soul, but where exactly it comes from is varied, or there are different interpretations in the literature, and they may not even be mutually exclusive. There may be different places, different receptacles that contain souls of converts. Many of the sources connect the souls of converts, of righteous converts, back to Abraham and Sarah. You recall they made souls in Haran. Maybe this is referring quite literally to the souls of converts. There's a lot of uh, Kabbalistic takes on this. The Kabbalists, for example, tell us that a person is, is a hybrid. It's a fusion of body and soul. And therefore, if you wanted to forge a human, you want to create a human, or better yet, the, the process of creating a new human, well, it has to happen on, on two different planes, on two different dimensions. You have to make the body, and you have to make the soul. Or you have to summon the soul, perhaps more accurately. Summon the soul that's in a heavenly vault waiting to be attributed to a body. Abraham and Sarah for many years did not have any children. But that would be not 100% accurate. Their relationship did not bear fruit. It did not produce bodies of children. But it did, we're told in the Kabbalists. It did produce souls of children. Their unification, so to speak, that maybe they hoped would produce offspring, did produce offspring, but only souls. Of course, later on, Isaac is born. But before that, their relationship spawned not bodies, but yes, Souls. And that's why a convert receives one of those souls and can literally be 
described as the son of Abraham and Sarah. Why? Because their soul, quite literally, according to this tape in the Kabbalists, came from Abraham and Sarah. So as an example of this, when someone brings the first fruit, we read about it in Parshas Tisavo in the book of Devarim, they talk about the land that was given to our forefathers. Is a convert able to say that statement? Can the convert say the declaration of the first fruit? Their forefathers didn't receive the promise of the land. But if they're a righteous convert, their actual forefathers are Abraham and Sarah, who did receive that pledge, and therefore that is why a convert is allowed, a righteous convert is allowed to recite that part of the declaration of the first fruit, and they're telling the truth. In a different Midrash, we find a different origin story of the souls of converts. After Isaac was born, Sarah was already 90 years old, and uh, people didn't believe that she was the actual mother. So the verse tells us that she nursed other babies. And every baby who had the great privilege of suckling from Sarah, every one of those babies, eventually, those souls eventually came back as souls of converts. And this is the power of breastfeeding that we're told about in the literature. The Tosfos in the book of Avodazar, page 10b, tells us, quotes a Midrash, that when Rabbi Judah the Prince was born, this was during the Hadrianic persecutions, and there were rules against circumcision. Any child that was circumcised, both the child and the mother, would be executed. And Rabbi Judah the Prince came from the most prestigious family amongst the, the Jewish people, and he was circumcised. And mom was summoned to Rome. They wanted to inspect this baby, and if he in fact was circumcised, he would be executed along with mom. And along the way, as they're traveling to Rome, we're told, she meets a Roman woman, also with a small infant, and they chat. And this Roman woman discovers what's happening over here. And she offers to swap babies. And they swap babies. And Rabbi the Prince's mother brings this Roman baby that's uncircumcised to Rome. They inspect it. Well, the kid's not circumcised. You could go home, ma'am. Sorry for the misunderstanding. And then they rendezvous again and they swap babies back. And of course, the Jewish baby is able to avoid being executed and eventually grows up to become the leader of the Jewish people and the codifier of the Mishnah, Rabbi Judah the Prince. What about that Roman baby? He too earns distinction, eventually becoming the Roman emperor, Antoninus known to us as Marcus Aurelius Antonius, and the Talmud tells us that he converted. And why did he convert? Because for a few short days, he merited to suckle from this very righteous woman, and that milk elevated his soul and made it the soul of a convert. Fascinating stuff. This is another take on the origin story of the souls of converts They came from all those babies that Sarah nursed. Another approach to the origin of souls of converts comes courtesy of the Gona Vilna. The Midrash tells us that when the Almighty gave the Torah to the Jewish people, he also offered it to the other Gentile nations. 
unlike the Jews who said in Asaf Nishma, we will do and we will listen, the Gentile nations refused. They asked, well, what's in it? Tell us the details. We want to read the fine print. And when they were told what the Torah contains, they opted out. But there were some individuals amongst those nations, the nations that did not accept the Torah. There were some individuals, some conscientious dissenters who wanted to accept the Torah, but were outvoted. Those souls are destined to have their wishes fulfilled when they convert and join the nation and accept the Torah again. They voted to join Sinai 1.0 and they were outvoted, but they are given a second chance to convert via a Sinai 2.0 ceremony. Now, there are other approaches as to the origin of the souls of converts. And again, many of these are very Kabbalistic. I find it to be very fascinating, so I'll share with you. As we mentioned earlier, they might not be mutually exclusive. Maybe there are multiple ways that souls of converts can originate. One of the takes is that actually the souls of converts are souls of the Jewish people that somehow got trapped amongst the nations. Somehow, via a sin, a Jewish soul finds itself in a very inhospitable surroundings and it needs to be brought back to its people. And the process of conversion is the restoration of the soul to its original family and nation. This is a new idea. The soul was always a Jewish soul. It got misplaced. It got lost. It's not a new soul, but a lost one. And this idea is presented in a slightly different way in the Arachayim, the beginning of Parashas Tiseitze. He talks about, this is again very advanced stuff, but he talks about souls being taken captive. And when Adam sinned, part of the soul or the elements of of Adam was taken hostage by the other side, by the dark side. And those souls are actually very gifted, very talented, very abled, Able body, but that doesn't make sense, but able souled souls. And these are the souls of converts. And that's why some of the most impressive people of our history, like Ruth, etc., Shmai and Aftalio and Unculus, they're converts. It's because they actually have a very lofty, lofty, lofty soul. A soul that really belongs to our people. It was taken captive. And now it has been redeemed. And then he tells us another secret. There's a concept called, this is my words, a Siamese soul. Where you have a soul of a very, very righteous person, a very lofty soul, that is somehow cleaving to the soul of a sinner. And they need to be separated. And he tells us that the soul of the great sage from the Mishnah, Rabbi Hanina Batradion, was somehow stuck to the soul of Shechem ben Hamor. And when Dina cohabited with Shechem in the book of Genesis, she managed to remove, so to speak, to free that soul from its captivity. Very advanced stuff, but very interesting as to the origin of the souls of converts. And finally, one more idea, and that is that there's a process via which the study of Torah 
can create, can spawn new souls. Via the study of Torah, either by sages or maybe by the righteous in the world of the souls, in Gan Eden. There is some sort of process via which the study of Torah, which is the blueprint for the world, it can also create new souls as was done with the creation of the world. Of course, it's very advanced stuff. But suffice it to say that all these opinions agree that the souls that inhabit the righteous converts, those souls are very special. The soul that a convert acquires is very lofty. Now, regardless of the origin of the soul, of a convert, of a righteous convert, those souls were actually present, we're told, at the founding events of our people. The Talmud in the book of Shabbos, page 146, tells us that the souls of converts were actually at Sinai. And we read more about that in the Balaturim to Devarim 33.3. The converts that in the future will convert were present at Sinai. And the souls of converts were also present at the adjuring of the plains of Moab. We read in the Talmud in the book of Shuas, page 39a. So, of course, all this elevates the subject when we learn that a convert doesn't just change their affiliation. Uh, I was part of this nation, now I'm part of that nation. It's a complete recreation of a human, a brand new baby, their previous soul gets swapped out and a brand new, or maybe not so brand new, an old soul. Is it possible to even say ages for souls? I don't know. But a very lofty soul from very lofty supernal origins replaces that void. And we noted this unusual pattern that righteous converts seem to come from some of the most heinous and villainous individuals of our history. Of course, we're about Jethro, the Kanyashenti of idolatry and, and Rachel of the prostitute, and it was Radin and the descendants of Haman and, and Sisra. And many of these righteous converts historically play a very significant role in our nation's history. So the primary personalities who gave us Torah seem to be associated with converts, Moshe, Uncle, Ezra, Retiever, Rabbi Meir, etc. So what do we make of this pattern that people that do really terrible things somehow have a likelihood to convert? So, of course, on a basic level, it tells us that even someone that does something very unforgivable, they can still convert. Even people who do despicable things can be accepted. The Midrash tells us that there was a woman who came to the great rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer, and she wanted to convert. And he said, well, let's, let's do the interview. Let's, let's find out what you're made of. What's your story? What's your background? So she said, well, my younger son was fathered by my older son. So obviously this is a woman with a behavior that's so unconscionable. So Rabbi Yezer bounced around. This is not, you're, you're not a candidate. She went to Rabbi Yoshua and he accepted her. And she converted. So clearly we see that even someone that does something very improper, very wrong, very evil as a non-Jew, they still potentially can convert. But I think there's something maybe a little bit deeper here. Specifically someone that exhibits very high degrees of impurity 
that might actually be the best breeding ground, so to speak, for conversion. It seems like the the worst stock that a person comes from, that seems to increase the likelihood that they will convert and even become someone very special. So it's almost like the essence of conversion is this idea. A non-Jew becomes Jewish. Abraham. Where did Abraham come from? His father, Terach, was the biggest idolater in the whole world. His country, his land, his city where he came from was an epicenter of idolatry. And specifically from the most unholy sources comes the most special and holy products. Who brings out this pure from the impure? This is the handiwork of God. So that's conversion in general, but it's accentuated by some of the villains that converted. And the sources talk about this. And they offer several similar and interrelated ideas to explain why some of the most lofty, righteous converts originate in some of the lowliest of places. One idea that we see again and again is the idea that to someone's degree of impurity is the degree of the latent potential for holiness that they harbor. There's going to be a balance. And the two sides have to be commensurate with each other. There has to be, we're told, a very powerful kernel of holiness submerged in something very, very wicked and evil. And on the flip side, if there is a very bright beacon of holiness, it necessarily must be, in some capacity, paired with some counterforce of equal power. And these are different ways to say the same idea. Another way it's presented is that the Yetzirah cleaves to holiness. It's attracted to holiness. And therefore, the people that have the greatest potential will also have the greatest Yetzirah. The more power something has, the thicker the shell encasing it will be. And therefore, if you find someone that's very non-righteous, you know that there's a spark there. That if you manage to isolate that spark and to fan that spark of holiness that exists amid the degenerate mass, and you can fan those flames of holiness, you will end up with a very bright beacon. There's another way to frame this same concept. And that is, if you want to hide something very holy and very special, and you don't want it to attract too much undue attention, you want to place it in the place where people would, people and forces would least expect it to reside. If you want to hide a diamond, sometimes the best place to put it is in a mass of dirt. The more inconspicuous the background, the better it can be hidden. If you want to hide something that is exceedingly holy and you don't want it to be tampered with by the Satan, you want to allow it to flourish, so to speak, unimpeded, find a place to put it where no one would consider, no one would think about it, and then it can fly underneath the radar. Now, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Does the holiness come first or the potential for the holiness? Or does the impurity come first? I don't know. And maybe it's different in every case. But regardless, there is an idea and a principle that's very pertinent to our subject. And that is that the sides are going to be balanced. And if you have, if you have a Sisra, it's not a surprise that from this person can emerge a Rabbi Akiva. Because if you take one side of the equation, you know that at least potentially that very same virulence 
that's directed towards bad, there is a possibility, there's a potential for it to manifest itself, for that, for that quality to manifest itself in the completely opposite direction. And that will look like Rabbi Tiva, and even Rabbi Tiva himself, before he became a sage, the Talmud famously tells us, that he hated the rabbis and the sages and he wanted to bite them like a donkey. Like a donkey? Why like a donkey? Because a donkey shatters bones. So that's a, an important idea here. I'll give you one more. You know, this is going to be a long podcast. So I figure what difference does it make? We'll just add a few more minutes here. There's another idea that is pertinent to this subject. And that is the concept of tsaras. Tsaras is like a, a skin malady that imparts impurity, ritualistic impurity to the person who has that malady. But there's something very unique in that if a person is completely covered from head to toe with tsaras, then ironically, counterintuitively, They are pure. If something is completely, 100% covered in impurity, that must be pure. And the principle behind this is that impurity can never exist on its own if it's not marbleized with some small drop at a minimum of purity. The evil cannot exist if it doesn't have at least a scintilla of good with it. Falsehood has no feet. It collapses. All falsehood must contain a kernel of truth, of stability, or else it will implode. And therefore we have this idea that if something is totally impure, invariably it must boomerang into total holiness. So perhaps this is yet another reason why some of the worst villains of our history eventually spiritually concatenated into total holiness. When there's absolutely nothing on a spiritual level redeeming about an entity, it must cease to exist in its current form and be reborn as the complete opposite of what it was. Now, how exactly this works and what the mechanism is, is a great mystery. But this principle is a well-accepted one in our philosophy, and perhaps it can explain the phenomenon that we see of very righteous and impactful converts that emanate from some of the most questionable, problematic, villainous of sources. Now, after someone converts, they're like a new person, they're like a baby, they have a new soul, an elevated soul. But that's not the end of the journey. That's the beginning. And they have their work cut out for them. The demands that are placed upon a convert are enormous. With their added holiness, they are now going to be subject to a more ferocious Yetzirah. The Talmud tells us that it's harder for them to get close to Hashem. The Jewish people were told, and this is in the Talmud of the Book of Kiddush on page 70b, our relationship with the Almighty is such that he initiates closeness and we must reciprocate it. But he starts. By contrast, the converts, they have to initiate. They cannot wait for the Almighty to initiate. They cannot be complacent. They have to take the first step. Converts, the Talmud in the book of Yuvamas, page 48b, tells us, they have a hard time. And they're subject to difficulties. And why are they subject to difficulties? A few answers the Talmud tells us. A, they're punished for their sins that they did as a non-Jew. 
before they became Jewish. They didn't keep the seven Ohad laws properly, and that's why they're punished. Now, the Talmud questions us, wait a minute. Gerish and his guy are kikonchinola dummy. A convert that converts is like a new baby and therefore cannot be held accountable to their sins that they did previously as a non-Jew. They don't take any of their baggage with them. So why are they punished? Why do they suffer? Why are difficulties placed in their way? Because they are not experts in all the precise, minute details of the mitzvahs, like their biologically Jewish counterparts. And therefore, it's likely that they maybe make some mistakes. And that's intolerable. Once someone converts, they're obligated by every single mitzvah to the complete letter of the law, like every other Jew. And if they're not proficient in the precise details, then the Almighty will subject them to difficulties. They cannot shirk their newfound responsibilities. A third reason the Talmud tells us as to why converts suffer is because they do mitzvahs out of fear of God, but not out of love of God. And finally, the fourth reason that the Talmud tells us as to why converts suffer is because they tarried in joining the nation. And therefore, they must suffer some consequences. So when someone converts, it's just an incredible thing. They're beloved by God. They're granted with a very lofty soul. And they're elevated to a wonderful, lofty state. But that's not where it ends. They have a lot of work left to do. Now, when we examine the subject of conversion, there's one theme that seems to repeat itself over and over again. This is the concept that we called earlier the the dichotomy of conversion. We see in the sources maybe what appears to be contradictory takes on conversion. So, for example, we just learned that the righteous convert may face some difficult times because they tarried in converting. They should have converted earlier. Evidently, it's it's proper for someone who is a righteous convert to join the nation pronto. And that's something that we should maybe encourage. There are other sources that indicate that we should encourage conversion or at least that conversion should be made easy and the importance of us of the court doing the conversion and and maybe even streamlining it. After all, you recall that the reason why we are in exile is to gather converts. That's why we're here. Moreover, if a Jewish court rejects a righteous convert, refuses to convert them, it can have devastating consequences. The Talmud tells us of a woman named Timna. She wanted to join the Jewish people before Sinai. And she came to Abraham. And Abraham says, no, you're you're not a candidate. And Isaac, he rejected her as well. And Jacob, Jacob did not accept her. So she said, well, this wing of the family is not accepting me. I'm going to go join the other wing of the family. And she went to Asaph's family, and she became a concubine to Eliphaz, the son of Asaph. And she said, I prefer to have some sort of association with this family, even if it means to be a concubine for the other part of the family. Well, who is her son? Her son, the son of Timnah, that she bore to Eliphaz, is someone named Amalek who is the founder of the nation of Amalek, the nation that has caused us all manner of problems throughout our history. Why, says the Talmud, 
has our nation suffered so much at the hands of Amalek? It's for the grave mistake of rejecting Timna, Amalek's mother. We should have converted her. And the reason why our nation is condemned to suffer at the hands of Amalek is because of the decision of our ancestors to reject Timna's application to be a convert. This is another example of the importance of accepting righteous converts. The Midrash tells us about the importance of keeping the door open for converts. It tells us, Chavivim Hagerim, beloved, are converts. It's a really wonderful thing to have a righteous convert. And then it tells us that the reason why Abraham only circumcised at the age of 99, Abraham was righteous for a very long time before he was circumcised. God appears to him in prophecy decades before he circumcised. So why didn't God tell Abraham when he was 20 or, or 30 to circumcise? Why did Abraham circumcise only at the age of 99? Says the Midrash, to not dissuade people. Had Abraham circumcised at the age of 20 or 30, then anyone who learns his story says, well, I'm too old for this. I'm already 45. I'm already 50. I'm over the hill. I'm past the age of circumcising and converting. And therefore, to not lock the door before potential righteous converts, Abraham only circumcised at the age of 99. So again, we see this emphasis of the importance of us accepting converts. On the other hand, the sources instruct the courts to dissuade potential converts. Talmud even tells us that someone who just accepts converts very openly will be punished for it. The Talmud tells us that converts are its a problem for us. And they're as difficult for Israel as a skin malady. And we don't, of course, proselytize like other nations. So, from these sources, it's evident that we don't solicit converts. We don't want them. So which is it? Are we supposed to accept them enthusiastically? Are we going to be punished for repelling them? Or are we supposed to dissuade them? Do we want converts? Or do we not want them? So I think this brings us to the crux of the whole subject. Not all converts are created equal. Our sages tell us that if someone converts for the wrong reasons, they don't actually want to reenact Sinai. They don't actually want to commit themselves completely to God. They have an insincere reason for conversion. That is not a real convert. What is demanded of a convert, it's, it's very high. It's a very high bar. You're asking someone based upon their conviction and their, their, their desire to do more on a spiritual level. You ask them to abandon their previous identity, to become someone new. And to do that, to actually be a righteous convert, someone has to be very sincere. Someone must have a genuine desire to forfeit their existing identity and to adopt a new one. They have to be willing to accept everything, to change everything. The Midrash tells us that if someone agrees to accept all of Torah, besides for one law, ah, this one I'm not accepting. Even if it's a rabbinic law, that's not a good convert. They have to demonstrate total commitment. And the Midrash emphasizes that this extends to things beyond just law and halacha. 
the convert is asked to change their culture and their pastimes and their society to really abandon your previous life and to adopt a new one. And what's this new society that you're joining? It's the society of Sinai. And the essence of Sinai was when the Jewish people committed themselves totally to God, like a servant to their master. Is someone who wants to convert really trying to reenact Sinai? Or is there something else perhaps animating their desire to convert? This is the dichotomy of conversion. On one hand, we have the converts that are really committed. And those people, we're in big, big trouble if we reject them. And those people can play a very important role in advancing the cause of our nation. Those are righteous converts. They're beloved. And collecting those souls is the objective of the exile. But there are other conversion candidates that are not fully committed. They're not fully sincere. They're not willing to forfeit everything to nestle under the wings of the Shekhinah. Those converts are trouble. Bad converts. Insincere converts. Not fully genuine converts have unleashed all manner of trouble for us throughout our history. All the sins of the wilderness were the handiwork of converts, of the, so to speak, mixed multitude, the Erev Rav, that joined the nation. And even throughout history, we have the the whole Kuthite nations, the Kusim. And they caused us all kinds of trouble, and they were, so to speak, converts. But we weren't sure if they were truthful converts or they were insincere ones. The genuine, sincere, committed converts are amazing. To some extent, the Midrash tells us that they are more righteous than biological Jews. Even though they didn't witness the miracles of the Exodus, they are willing to forfeit everything for God. The insincere converts, on the other hand, they are a terrible black eye for our people. You recall that we spoke about Jethro. He circumcised with a very sharp knife. The Maharal says that this is the exception. Not everyone is like Jethro. And this is where the danger, the problem, the controversy of conversion lies. The righteous converts are the ones who use a very sharp scalpel and collecting them and integrating them amongst our people. That is the number one priority of our nation in the exile. Converts who want to use a dull knife, so to speak, that's what we must avoid. And this idea explains many aspects of conversion. There are many sources that talk about the inspection, the vetting of a conversion candidate, and the importance of doing a thorough investigation, a thorough inspection, to try to determine the motivation of the convert. Do they want to convert because they'll get some money or because they'll get some power or prestige or maybe they're scared of something or maybe they have their sights set on marrying a Jew? This is the responsibility of the court, says the Midrash, to suss out, to determine, to flesh out the sincerity and commitment of the conversion candidate. The Talmud tells us that when a convert comes to convert in these days, we say to him, why do you want to convert? We try to figure out what is going on, what is motivating this behavior. And then they try to dissuade the candidate. Don't you know that the situation for the Jewish people today is not that great? We are oppressed, we are persecuted, we are marginalized, we suffer. 
why do you want to do this? So again, on one hand, we're trying to kind of push them away to see, do they have real sincerity? And if they demonstrate that they are really sincere and they're a really righteous conversion candidate, then they ought to accept them right away. And the court has to kind of thread the needle. They're trying to push away and reject the insincere candidates and the ones that are sincere. Once they have exhibited that, they're trying, in fact, to welcome them into the family. This is why our cities tell us that you have to be very careful doing this. I mentioned at the top, you know, our, our organizations do this. Why not? This is the reason why. It's big responsibility. And the Talmud tells us that untold harm will befall those who accept converts willy-nilly. So on one hand, we're, we're punished if we reject a good candidate, but we're in big trouble if we accept a bad candidate. And that is the balance that the court has to strike. And that's why what they inform them and what they tell them has to be such that they're able to actually determine how sincere and how committed this person is. The righteous converts, the court is instructed to embrace. And the insincere converts, that's the group that causes a lot of problems for our people, they are trying to reject them. This is the role of the court. And different times, different situations call for different tactics to make this discernment, to make this determination as to the sincerity of the person trying to convert. So you'll notice the Talmud that I mentioned earlier tells us that when a, when a convert in today's day, in these days, comes, and you try to figure out what's going on, you try to dissuade them. And you say, don't you know that the Jewish people, we suffer, we're persecuted, we're marginalized. This is not some sort of magical formula that needs to be said to every candidate. The Talmud explicitly says that this is talking about in a time when the Jewish people were, in fact, downtrodden and depressed. In that situation, the correct line of questioning that you need to do to determine how sincere someone is, is that line of questioning. Well, what about if times change and things are wonderful? It's not appropriate to say, well, why do you want to join the Jewish people? Don't you know that the Jewish people suffer and they're marginalized and they're tormented and they're persecuted? That's not the angle that the court would use in that time. In fact, we have a precedent for this. In the times of David and Solomon, when the Jewish people were at their apotheosis, the courts did not accept converts. There was too much of a risk that someone would be insincere and would be drawn to the power, to the prestige of the nation, but not really committed to be a servant of God. In the times of Messiah as well, converts will not be accepted. Everyone at that time will want to convert, and the grand transformation of conversion doesn't apply in those times. So when things are bad, the way that you determine sincerity is, is the way the Talmud outlines. But in each generation, in each situation, in each time, the court is tasked with finding what is potentially the superficial reasons that a person would want to convert, what would potentially encourage someone to insincerely convert. So the Talmud tells us, as an example of this idea, that there was a very reputable sage, none other than Hillel the Elder, 
who apparently violated this law. He didn't inspect a conversion candidate the way the Talmud instructs us to. Talmud gives a, a, a few humorous stories about a series of converts that wanted to convert in the times of Hillel and Shammai. There was a Gentile who came to Shammai and says, well, how many Torahs do you have? Two Torahs, written Torah and oral Torah. Well, I believe in the written Torah, but not the oral Torah. Would you convert me based upon that? And Shammai screamed at him and says, get out of here. If you want to convert, you have to accept written Torah and oral Torah. This individual was undeterred, and he walked down the block, and he went to Hillel. Will you convert me if I accept only the written Torah and not the oral Torah? And Hillel says, yes. And Hillel converted him. And the next day he says, well, you gotta, you got to learn the Torah, right? So he says, well, let me, let me teach you the alphabet, the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet. And he said, we're going to start with the first four letters. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, and Dalet. Okay, review them. These are the shapes of the letters. These are the sounds of the letters. Come back tomorrow for your second lesson. The next day he shows up. He's been practicing the whole night. And Hill says, okay, let's start with the first letter. And he swaps it. Bez, Aleph, Dalet, Gimel. And he says different sounds and different letters, different shapes. What's going on over here? Yesterday he told me the opposite. So he'll say to him, well, you believe me in how to write the letters and how to pronounce the letters? Believe me as well in the concept of oral Torah. What he's saying is, is that we need an oral tradition even to read the letters of the written Torah. And that is an indispensable part of Torah. That is the first story. The second story talks about the individual who wants to convert while balancing on one leg. He goes to Shammai. Shammai says, get out of here. Hillel says, that that you don't like, don't do to your friend. That's the core, the kernel of Torah. And everything else is but commentary. And he converted him. And finally, a third story. The non-Jew hears about the special priestly garments and he really covets to wear them and says to Shammai, well, convert me so I could be the Kohen Gadol, I could be the high priest. Of course, someone who is not a direct descendant of Aaron is not a candidate to be the high priest. But this person doesn't care. Convert me. I want to be the high priest. Shammai says, get out of here. Scram. Why are you driving me crazy? He goes to Hillel. Hillel says, okay, I'll convert you. And he converted. He says, but before you become a high priest, you got to know the laws. Go read the laws. And he comes upon a law. And the law says, well, someone who is not a Kohen, who does work in the temple, is executed. So he goes to Hill and says, well, who's this first talking about? He says, it's even talking about King David. Even King David, who is from the tribe of Judah, not from the tribe of Levi, not a Kohen, he cannot do work in the temple. So it finally clicked for the convert that he is not going to wear those sacred garments. The Talmud concludes that these three Converts got together once and they had a conversation about their experience going initially to Shammai and ultimately being converted by Hillel. Now, did Hillel follow the rules? Did he violate the protocol? This is the answer. The responsibility of the court is to discern the sincerity, the legitimacy of a conversion candidate. And the the critical point is not that you follow some sort of prescribed protocol, but to do whatever it takes to make sure that the candidate is qualified. Talmud tells us, I mentioned this earlier, those who accept converts without the requisite inspection are going to be punished. If you either encourage someone to convert 
or you do insufficient due diligence, you are going to be punished, says the Talmud. The book of Yavama is page 109b. But that doesn't mean that when someone comes to us to convert and they are righteous, that we should reject them. And of course, the example is from Timna. Someone who wants it, who pines for it, or as in the case of Hillel, it's evident that they are really sincere about it, such a person should in fact be accepted. Mirz tells us, just as the Almighty accepted us, we too are tasked with accepting converts. But the way it has to be done it's got to be done with great skill. And you got to push away with the left hand and bring close with the right. There is this, this, this sweet middle ground in which the court must arrive at. They have to straddle these two modes of pushing away and bringing close to actually determine the motivation of the convert. This places very big responsibility on the court. They have to accept the qualified and reject the unqualified. And they have to adroitly thread that needle. And not everyone is able to do this well. Rabbi Eliashev, one of the great halachic authorities of the last few decades, he was of the opinion that if someone made a mistake and granted conversion to someone who proves to be a poor candidate and someone that should have been rejected, the court that granted conversion is thenceforth disqualified from converting. This is not something to play games with. If someone displays incompetence in this very severe matter, they are thenceforth disqualified. This is why it's such a dicey subject and why it's so controversial and so delicate. And it's important to note there are some communities, most notably the Syrian Sephardic community, that has a rule. We don't accept converts at all. And if someone marries a convert, they're going to boycott the wedding. And that person will be ostracized from the community. This is, of course, not the mainstream, but the logic of it is sound. It's so subjective of a process, and it's so dangerous to make a mistake, and it's so serious of a matter, we just want to wash our hands clean of this whole subject, and we're not going to partake in it at all. And again, I have no commentary on that, but that philosophy is perhaps a bit more understandable once we see the sources and how delicate and serious of a matter this is. I want to end with some practical ideas and elements on this subject. And I want to remind you of what I said at the beginning. Torch, our organization, maintains a very strict rule not to get involved in conversions. So I am prohibited to get hands-on in this subject. And even if our organization allowed it, I don't feel qualified to play a part in this subject in a practical way. But this is what I want to share with you on a practical level. There is a process of conversion. Someone who is a Gentile can become a Jew. Now, if someone is already Jewish i.e. they're born to a Jewish mother, they do not need to convert. Once you're Jewish, there is no process to annul that, to undo that in any way. So there's no need to convert if someone already is Jewish. Uh, The exception to that may be if there are significant lapses in their genealogy. So for example, this is common, people from the former Soviet Union when there's very tenuous or even unreliable evidence to their Jewish heritage, 
or conversos or moranos, people who had a tradition that their grandmother used to light candles Friday night and no one knew why. And we know during the expulsion of the Jews from Spain and Portugal, many Jews, so to speak, nominally converted to Christianity, but maintained their Jewish practices surreptitiously. And therefore, if someone's a, a descendant of a descendant of a descendant, that your mother's 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 mother was Jewish, you're Jewish. So in such a situation, even though there may be grounds to suggest that such a person is in fact Jewish, from a halachic perspective, that's not enough to be relied upon. And there is a concept of conversion to just cover all bases. When someone has uncertainty in their standing as a Jew, you have this idea of conversion just in case, just in case they're not Jewish, you now remove any doubt. But what about a Gentile? I get this question asked very frequently. How do I convert? Does conversion exist? What do we need to do? And of course, this is very often by people that grew up perhaps with a different religion. And they have come to the realization that the Torah is true. And maybe they had questions that weren't satisfactorily answered. Many of them are very deeply religious, or they were, and they feel some sort of irresistible attraction to Torah, to Judaism, and they want to know what to do. They want to do what's right. They want to live in accordance with what the Almighty wants of them. And I have to say, some of the most inspirational people that I have come across are these kinds of people. People that are brave enough to abandon their previous religion, to abandon their previous identity, and to pursue truth. They want to do what's right. They want to follow Hashem. And many of them are curious about conversion. And I'll share with you what I think is my role to contribute to this subject. And that's two ideas. First of all, there is, I think, a, a misconception that may exist. And that is that if you realize that the Torah is true and the Jewish people are the nation of God, some people may feel like it's imperative for them to convert. So the first thing that people need to be told if they are in this situation is that there is no need for any hysteria, there's no need to rush, there's no need for pressure, and that is because we don't believe that everyone needs to be Jewish. A righteous Gentile, which is defined as someone who does what the Almighty expects of a non-Jew, namely the seven Noahide laws, a righteous non-Jew merits a portion in Olam Abba, in the world to come. You don't need to be Jewish to be a good person and to do what the Almighty wants of you. Today, there are even communities of righteous Noahides, some of the most impressive and inspiring people that I have encountered. There is a wonderful organization that we work with. I recommend people look into it. It's called Nativ. This is comprised of Gentiles, mostly former Christians, who have accepted Hashem and His Torah. And they don't, or they haven't converted, but they are a community of righteous Noahides. And they get together, and they study a bunch of times a week, and they study in a way that is befitting, that is appropriate for righteous Gentiles. And they have something very special. Even more than the, the study group that they get to do together, they have the support network and the camaraderie and the sense of community that they have with each other. People who are religious in other religions, and then they leave, they are abandoning their previous support network, and this organization provides a support network for those kinds of people. Moreover, conversion is not something that you have to rush into. To be a righteous Noahide, it's a very wonderful state. 
Now, even if someone does choose to go down the path of conversion, they have to know that, again, there's no rush. It's a long process. If it's done right, it's extremely rigorous and comprehensive. It's not uncommon when it's done right for it to take a very, very long time. In our community here in Houston, we have a convert that I believe was in the process of conversion for more than a decade. Again, there's no, there's no need to rush. And the Almighty will not punish you if you approach this subject methodically and systematically and do it properly. So that's point number one. There's no need to rush and there's no need to be rash in your behavior, in your, in your choices. There's no need to make a mad dash towards conversion. Point number one. Point number two. If someone does choose to seek conversion, it is imperative that they understand the different types of conversions and standards of conversions that are available. Now, I'm not in the business of deciding who is and who isn't Jewish and which conversion is and which isn't legitimate. But it's very important for a person to know that there are wildly different standards amongst different conversion entities. And many of them do not conform even to the most basic of halachic standards. And of course, if a conversion does not conform to halacha, it is not halachically valid. And I would strongly caution against seeking a subpar conversion. You know, if someone, God forbid, needed a complicated surgery, you wouldn't look in the yellow pages for a surgeon, you would find the absolute best. This process of conversion will determine someone's standing. You don't want to go with some subpar version, you want the absolute best. A friend of mine told me he was seeking a conversion and Houston happens to have a wonderful orthodox halachic conversion court. But he told me, I'm not going to Houston. I'm going to Chicago. I'm going to find the best court in the whole country. And I understand that sentiment. Because if you want to do this, you want to do it as best as can possibly be done. And again, you don't need to do it. But if you choose to do it, it makes sense to do it in the best possible fashion. You don't want to have a conversion. You did so much. You forfeited so much. You committed so much. And then people will quibble with the efficacy and legitimacy of that conversion. Many people that go to Israel, they want to make aliyah. And then they discover that, you know, in Israel, the conversion authority that did their conversion is not recognized. And that's very disappointing, very painful for people. And of course, that's a controversial subject on its own. But the, the bottom line principle is that you don't need to do it. But if you do, you are encouraged to do it as best can possibly be done. This is a very important subject. It's a very serious subject. I hope that we treated it with the proper amount of gravity that it deserves. I want to end with just an observation. The Talmud tells us that the objective that we have in the exile, it's to gather the souls of the converts. And this is pure speculation, but you would imagine that as the exile nears its end, as we approach the final throes of the exile, you would expect there to be a proliferation of converts. So today, as I mentioned at the top, we're seeing a groundswell of people that are curious, that are interested about the Torah and about Judaism. Perhaps, who knows, but perhaps this portends to the imminence of Messiah, who knows? I want to end with a blessing. May we all be so fortunate as to witness those days. May they come speedily in our time. This is all I know about the subject. I'm happy to still field your questions. You can always send me an email, rabbiwalbajim.com. But this is all I know. 
I hope it was interesting. I hope it was informative. I hope it was beneficial. And I appreciate your time. Send me an email, rabbiwolby at gmail.com.